Thank you, John. And it's a, it's a great, great pleasure to uh, introduce you, uh, Anthony Bebbington. He will talk about struggles over resource governance in Latin America's extractive industries, the politics of institutional resistance and change. Uh, and the booklet all of you received, you have a very long uh, biography. And in, in the case of Anthony, I would say it's worth reading uh, because there are many uh, uh, positions. I, I would like to stress a few ones. Uh, Professor Anthony Bebbington is director of the Graduate School of Geography and Higgins Professor of Environment and Society at Clark University. Uh, he holds a professorial research fellow in the School of Environment and Development, University of Manchester, Manchester the UK, and research associate uh, of the Centro Peruano de Estudios Sociales. Uh, uh, so connected to three centers in three different uh, uh, areas of the world. Uh, uh, he's a member of the US National Academy of Sciences. And his recent work addresses extractive industries, social movements, state formation, territorial dynamics, and livelihoods. So uh, many of the issues that will be discussed throughout the conference. Uh, the way we will proceed uh, is that we have one hour for this panel, and John told me we have to be strict in finishing it in time. So Anthony we will talk for 40 minutes, and then we have Q&A Q for, for 20 minutes. So I would like all of you to join me in welcome Anthony Bevington to, to the, this podium. Well, um, many thanks for the invitation. Thanks to John Mins, thanks to Anklas, thanks to the university. Thank you to you all for coming along. Um, it's a real pleasure and honor to be here for various reasons. But one I, I would say um, from the outset is that as a graduate student, as it happens, a l quite a lot of the work that I had to read uh, came out of ANU. At that time, there was a group of geographers and anthropologists in particular working on the politics of the relationship between environment and development and their work became really important for, as one of the inputs in laying down an approach to thinking about that relationship between resources and development that's carried on through to the present. Um, so it's a real pleasure at a personal level to be at ANU. It's kind of taking me back to my comprehensive reading lists for my doctoral examinations. Um, now I'm going to have to... As when John was laying out the, um, the context of the conference, the point of reference was the, the growth of investment in and interest in mining oil and gas resources in Latin America over the last 20 years, 15 to 20 years. Um, and there are different ways of trying to capture that increased interest. These are just three graphics, uh, the, the two on the, in the two, uh, bottom right and top left corner capture the increase in licenses for exploration for hard rock mining. The bottom left is, is rather a, a measure of, of exports. But the general message of these different ways of trying to capture that growth is that throughout the 2000s, from the Latin 90s through the 2000s, the, the curves were, if not always exponential, they were certainly trending upwards. Now, some of those curves may have topped out a little bit in the last year or two. But the general pattern is that of a, of a curve that jumped significantly. One could put other curves there as well, which would be relevant for some of us in the room, which would be curves that would be trying to capture the changing degrees of interest of development agencies on the one hand and researchers on the other hand in extractive industries. And I think those curves would also be moderately exponential, but they would begin later than these curves. There's a sense in which both those worlds, particularly research, I think, in Latin America, has been a bit behind the empirical phenomenon. I think it's worth reflecting a little bit on why that interest has grown, both among agencies and, uh, and among academics. On the one hand, I think among agencies, you have some agencies who've become increasingly interested in extractives because of the human rights issues, that uh, human environmental rights issues that resource extraction has implied. You have other agencies, the Oxfams would be a case in point where perhaps the primary reason has been to do with their, over their larger concerns for indigenous people's rights and indigenous people's livelihoods and the ways in which the rise of the extractive economy has affected that indigenous people's agenda. For an agency, for example, that I've come to work relatively closely with in, in recent years, the Ford Foundation, that historically had no interest 
in resource extraction, but did have significant programs in the region in transparency and efficient and accountable governance. With time, Ford began to realize that in many of the areas they were working on governance problems, it was impossible to think through governance without thinking through resource extraction, because so many of the conflicts, particularly the subnational authorities, were having to handle were linked to natural resource extraction. The World Bank and similar sorts of bodies interested in the sector for a variety of reasons, not just growth, but that would be one of them. So resource extraction for agencies has been, become, I think, an important platform for, through which they deal with larger issues of concern to them, rights, indigenous peoples, governance, and so on. And I think for social sciences as well, there's been a recognition in that when you the, the work on so the work on resource extraction is not just on resource extraction per se, but that it is also a platform for asking, and a necessary platform increasingly given these sorts of patterns, for asking other social science questions. For example, questions about the relationships between the political alliances that underlie growth strategies, patterns of change in the state, and patterns of democratization, for instance, or the relationships between contention and institutional change. So resource extraction has been important not only in and of itself, but as a platform for other normative agendas in development and analytical agendas in social science. Um, which is my segue into um, the question that underlies, or the, the quest, broad question that underlies the presentation I want to give uh, today, which grows out of, this is not a presentation about the natural resource curse, but that's the background debate for which, from which this interest in institutions emerges. Because beyond the arguments in the literature as to whether there is a natural resource curse or there's not a natural resource curse or how to escape from the natural resource curse, that's to say this notion that dependency on subsoil resources typically comes accompanied with subpar performance in the long, medium to long term in economic de development, social indicators, democratization. Whether that does or does not exist, what different parties in that debate seem to converge on is a recognition of the centrality of institutions and the quality of institutions in determining the relationship between resources and the qualities of, uh, of development. Um, now that then begs another question, which is a question that's both relevant for development agencies and also an analytical question, which is, so if institutions matter, how do they emerge? What are the conditions under which new institutional arrangements will emerge? By the same token, what are the conditions under which existing institutional arrangements become consolidated? Um, and so that's really the question that underlies this presentation, an interest in how institutions are consolidated and then may change. And that's a question that intersects with other literatures in, in, in the social sciences to do with the relationships between institutions and development, uh, the effects of history on that relationship, the relationships between social conflict and institutional change, a very venerable history of work, particularly on European democracy, that's traced the links between conflict and the emergence of democratic institutions and, and institutions of the welfare state in Europe, and, and, and so on. So that's the, the, the question that I want to hand, hand to talk around. And I want to just, before I get into the, actually the Latin American material, the, school, uh, the pardon, the school part. The school. Sorry, forgive the, um, the few conceptual digressions, but I want to put them there just to, to in the hope that, or the, the suggestion is, that certain ideas in these other debates might help us think about um, the nature of arguments over institutions for regulating extractive industry in Latin America today. And these are some ideas that emerge from some of that literature that I was referring to at the bottom of the last slide. Um, in recent years, in, among political scientists and economists, uh, there has been a, an increasing recognition, it's a variant of the natural resource curse discussion, really, uh, that, that institutions are also central to the qualities of, of development. Certain economic institutions become associated with patterns of development that are more inclusive. But that same discussion has also made very explicit the notion that the institutions that exist at any one point in time, um, the economic institutions and the political institutions are not independent of each other, and that underlying the coexistence and the co-constitution of those institutions are a set of relationships of power that, that constrain institutional options at any one point in time and over time. And that the tendency is that for, for extended periods of, that's the nature of institution, of relative stability. Authors referring to this as political equilibria, 
case of Aston and Robinson, or political settlements. There's just a quotation there from Jonathan de John. But the notion here is that certain institutional arrangements will persist over time um, as long as they're delivering levels of economic growth for different groups. They may not benefit in the same way from it, but, but can live with. As long as they're consistent with notions of what's legitimate, what you can get away with uh, in, uh, in that particular historical and social context. And as long as certain as different actors are not able, whether it's through force or through the power of argument or through the electoral process, to, to challenge uh, the, un the power relationships that sustain particular institutional arrangements uh, at a point in time. Um, now, that also draws attention to the notion that institutions aren't just there. They have to be kept there. There's a lot of hard work that goes into maintaining sets of institutional relationships, whether they're the relationships that determine how um, exploration licenses are, are given or determine the tax regulations for extractive industry at a point in time. There's a lot of work that goes into maintaining those as well as into changing them. Um, which means that institutional change doesn't come easily. But the literature, I think, also gives us some ideas, and I want to play some of these ideas in the empirics, empirical part of the presentation, about how change might occur in those relationships. Um, I want to refer to three. One I've already mentioned, this literature on contentious politics that suggests that co conflict may not just be a problem to manage, but analytically may well be an important driver of institutional change. Secondly, that arguments over ideas um, are not just so much fluff, that they can also be very significant in opening up spaces for institutional change. One can think about some of the transitions in a country like Bolivia, for example, in recent years, where clearly there's an element of contentious politics that helps explain what's happened in Bolivia, but also shifting arguments of that have changed dominant ideas about how society should be and how resources should be governed. And then other languages that would draw attention to the notion that institutions change also because certain rules get displaced, some institutions get placed on top of other institutions and they, don't, they, they can't exist together easily in the, long, in the medium to long term, uh, or under certain circumstances, a given institution gets reinterpreted and, and applied in different ways. Um, an example there from the region might well be, for example, the shifting applications of notions of protected areas to limit or create, depending on the context, space for further extraction of natural resources. Plenty of cases, well, not plenty, but a number of cases in point in recent times. Um, so the question is, what, what would drive those changes? Factors to do with changing coalitions in society that may, may, may derive from patterns of economic change, the emergence of new social actors, organized actors, mobilized actors, um, contending existing relationships, the emergence of what people in literature refer to as epistemic communities or policy networks. But let's say networks of people and institutions elaborating different sorts of arguments about how things should be. Arguments about in this case, natural resource management, or arguments about the relationship between development and resource extraction. But by the same token, those coalitions and, and actors and epistemic communities, are there, there are different sorts of coalitions and different sorts of uh, thinkers and policy networks trying to, to maintain existing institutional arrangements. So if you were to, in a very simple sense, and then this is where the, the blah stops in the presentation. Um, that's a really just a very simple model, not a model, a scheme, which I have to thank a reviewer of a paper for because they drew it for me, really. Um, <laughs> the, the idea that I want to focus on here, this notion that, um, in a macro sense, there's a sort of, there's a, a co-constitution between patterns of economic development and dominant political settlements, um, but that there are certain spaces that might open up to do with social conflict and learning that might drive institutional change. In our case, we're thinking about institutional change in the regulation of extractives. So as I say, that's everything from uh, institutions to do with three prime informed consent, to do with taxation, to do with land use planning, and so on and so forth. So the focus of what comes in the rest of the talk is, is asking that question, how far do those phenomena in that box help us understand the sorts of institutional dynamics surrounding extraction in the region? 
which takes me to my outline. The outline comes very late in talk. I've already, and I've, I've dealt with the first point already. What I want to do now is just reflect, say something about ways of thinking about the factors that have driven, or that continue to drive, but that have driven this expanded interest and investment in resource extraction in the region. And then I want, in, this, in a subsequent section, I want to suggest that some of the forms driven by that expansion have themselves helped induce new forms of mobilization, new forms of conflict. And then I want to close up pointing to examples of where one might be able to say that those new forms of mobilization, those conflicts, um, have helped craft institutional change, but I want to say that in most instances, that change is very much incomplete. And I think perhaps part of the explanation of why extractives has become such a contentious political theme in the region is precisely because some of those debates around institutions governing extractives are so uncertain right now. Um, so that's what I want to get through. Now, there's a narrative about the growth of, extract, of investment in the sector that, that we all know that's more related to international factors to do with new, new sources of investment, growing demand, increasing prices, although, of course, prices have dropped in recent, in recent months. Um, and that's part of the story. What I want to focus on here, however, is this, a second part of the story, not to say that it's the most important part, but I think it's part that's not necessarily reflected on quite in the same way to do with domestic factors <coughs> that help understand this growth of investment in the sector. And I want to focus on the third of those in particular and suggest that part of the explanation of where this increased interest in the sector comes from has been to do with what you might think, what one might call of as national political projects. Now, these ideas are just very general, but this, but this is what I want to elaborate in the next few slides. And I want to just use it just a bit with a, a slide or two slides on, on three or four countries just to try and make the point. So in the case of a country like Peru, which has seen particularly significant growth of investment in, in hard rock mining and hydrocarbons, it seems to me that one can craft an argument that says that what's happened to extractives in Peru has to be understood in context of the period since Sendero. That it's not... Accident, it's not, it's not insignificant that the first large foreign direct investment in Peru, uh, post Sendero, it wasn't even post, it was just as the war was beginning to wane, was indeed the, the investment in the Anacocha gold mine in Cajamarca. And that the subsoil, mineral resources, and hydrocarbon resources became central to a broader project of trying to restabilize Peru, restabilize it macroeconomically. Restabilize it in terms of redeveloping a fiscal basis for the state. Restabilize it in terms of developing resources for the state to reconsolidate and, and build its uh, authority and power at the center. And central to the a project of trying to build a notion of a different sort of Peru, a país minero that was mod that's modern, uh, that's modern and macroeconomically responsible, but also using resources for progr for iterative incremental. Uh, social, social investment, particularly under the most recent government. So beyond all the World Bank reforms, which are part of the story in Peru, and beyond all the interest of Newmont or Barrick or Rio Tinto, I want to suggest there's something else that helps explain the Peru story as well, which is about a national political project of post-conflict reconsolidation in which the subsoil plays a really important part. Absent that subsoil, the resources for that project would, would not be there. <coughs> and in, in, in very different sorts of ways, it's not post-conflict, but in very different sorts of ways, I think there's something not dissimilar in the case of Bolivia, where notwithstanding the very significant ideological and social differences between the Sanchez de Lusada period and the subsequent governments and the Morales and mass period, um, those different regimes have all placed natural resource extraction at the center of their larger projects. So in the case of the current government, natural resources 
is, I, and indeed this is not unrelated to the emergence of mass as a significant political actor, um, are bundled with arguments about sovereignty and about historical debts that have to be repaid, social debts that have to be repaid. And they become bundled with discussions about nationalization and taxation and so on and so forth. Um, but that the mass model as a political model could not, would not simply not be viable absent the natural resource base. And that, among other things, I think helps explain recent, well, not just recent, but interventions, particularly by Garcia Linera, but one of the more recent ones saying, well, we will now allow hydrocarbon extraction in protected areas. But these are just a few quotations that I've used in papers elsewhere from Morales and from Garcia Linera to try and draw attention to that centrality of the subsoil in this political project. So you have Morales, well, these just in no particular order. Morales saying, necessity obliges, obliges us to exploit this natural resource, the gas, the oil, for all, all Bolivians. If there's oil, you know it's for all Bolivians, and this money we collect from gas has to go to all Bolivians. What then, and this is in response to an NGO campaign <coughs> in Bolivia, is Bolivia going to live off if some NGOs say Amazonia without oil? They're saying, in other words, that Bolivians should have no money and that there should be no Juancito Pinto, Renta Dignidad. He's drawing the link explicitly between the existence of social protection programs, social investment programs, and the extraction of the subsoil resources, particularly hydrocarbons. And that those programs, in turn, are central to the legitimacy of the mass project because they are vehicles through which mass establishes um, legitimacy with uh, broader parts of the population. The case of Colombia, I understand there's uh, uh, representatives in the room, in, albeit with different matices, different nuances, there's a certain continuity in the centrality of natural resources, both in the Uribe period and certainly in the Santos government where the National Development Plan identifies mining as one of the five locomotoras of the National Development Plan. And a country like El Salvador, which is, I just put it up there, partly because I've been working there in recent years, and also because it's different but interesting in that I was just talking to a representative from the Australian government, and they were saying to me, oh, I don't associate El Salvador with mining. And, and it's true, there's no particular history of mining. There's some history, but then no significant history of mining in El Salvador. But even countries such as El Salvador um, have become, fallen under the, under the, into the area of interest of investors in, in this case, in, in, in hard rock mining. And again, that space that's been created for that interest, I think also has to be understood as part of a broader national political project. In the post-peace accord period, um, the, the ARENA government uh, became active in, in a series of reforms, including reforms to encourage investment in the mineral sector. Mining companies came in. <coughs> With the election of the FMLN government, this has presented them, and I'll come back to this at the end of the paper, at the end of the talk of this time, with a series of challenges because the mining sector or exploration of mining in El Salvador had become such a source of contention um, that it became a theme in the electoral campaign in 2007-8 uh, to which the, 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 two part, the, two, the different parties had to respond. Um, and in some respects, and again, hopefully there's time to reflect a bit more on this, part of the um, viability or not of the national project of this FMLN government, and we'll see the viability will probably be measured by what happens in the forthcoming elections next, early next year, will hinge around how they handled this, uh, this, this mining problem that was inherited from the period of the prior Arena governments. These projects have their geographies. I'm a geographer. <clears throat> I'm not actually a map maker, this is work done with colleagues. Um, and I think thinking about the geographies of what of the get produced by these projects helps us understand some of the conflictiveness, um, just helps us understand some of the institutional dimensions and conflictiveness that surrounds these projects. So this is a map of Peru, as you, can, as you know. And um, there must be a button with a light on here, but I'll use my finger. So the, the orange are uh, mining con exploration concessions, and these are... Um, Hydrocarbon, lots, so you see significant parts of Peru having been influenced by these licenses. A very large part of the country being influenced by the licenses. <coughs> we try to just say, okay, well, how do these 
geographies of licenses intersect with other geographies. One we were pretty interested in was water resources. So this, over time, tries to capture the changing percentage of drainage basins affected by mining licenses um, between 1992 over a 20-year period. And you see the, the gradual but very significant intensification of coverage of drainage basins um, in the coast and highlands, which is doubly significant given the nature of water constraints in, in Peru. We did a similar thing for agriculture. This is just using government data to try and overlap <coughs> concessions, licenses, this is just for mining in this case, um, with uh, areas of agricultural potential. And again, it's basically you see the same curves as you saw on the, on the very first slide, uh, the one after the title. So again, not insignificant. In a country with so relatively little high potential agricultural land, these degrees of overlap are, are issues for planning, or they should be issues for planning. And this is a map put together by a guy called Matt Feiner, um, who's done kind of continued working on these issues to do with hydrocarbon concessions in the, in the east of the Andes. And what his work uh, drew attention to in particular, that, that map expands and contracts depending on, uh, on the year, but it, as we saw in the previous map, still very significant parts of the Amazon affected by um, hydrocarbon uh, contracts and lots. And in his work, trying to draw attention to the overlaps between those lots and protected areas, and areas with indigenous title and areas set aside for the protection of indigenous peoples living in voluntary isolation. That's what IPLVI is. So these are geographies that are not innocent. They produce, they produce overlaps with other prior geographies. This is not an image of overlaps, just a sense of the, the kind of rapidity of change in the case of Colombia. Not change necessarily of investment in active mines, but of concessions, graphs put together, maps put together by a Colombian colleague, Guillermo Rudas. <coughs> this captures during the Pastrana period, and he, he tried to capture what's happened to concessions during the presidential period. At the end of Pastrana's government, the, the, the Arias Moradas, the blackberry colored, colored blocks, purple, sorry, trying, trying to find the word. Um, and uh, by the end of the, or to just, just before the end of the Uribe government, uh, these are the licenses that have been granted for hard rock mining. <clears throat> this is what we've been granted and what was under consideration by the end of that period. So very, again, these national political projects have geographical uh, implications. In the case of El Salvador, so this comes out really badly, sorry, it's a, it's a poor map, but the areas that are vaguely yellow, although actually they're pink on the screen, but here yellow, here and here, are the areas where increasing interest in not just interest, but, but exploration rights uh, in, in mining were, were acquired. Um, and importantly, many of those areas overlapped with significant areas of conflict during the Civil War, which, be, for the, particularly for the FMLN government, were critical areas for the national development planning for the FMLN, which prioritized, among other things, peace, security, and reconsolidation in the post-war period. So again, another overlap between areas of concession, and in this case, areas of social division and memories of conflict, which is an overlap that's not insignificant for its sector that has tended to be de por si conflictive. So what about those maps? What Apologies for the couple of colleagues in, room, in the room who've seen those maps in the, in the presentation I gave a few, a few weeks ago. Um, what do they reflect? What, how might I read them? I mean, they're patterns, but I think they, they do reflect part of this working out of these national projects. But they also reflect a really not, not insignificant lack of alignment between different planning systems, for man different systems for managing different resources, water, agriculture, um, and, and, and the subsoil in those, in those images that produce these overlapping geographies of claims and rights. Because the concessions are rights. They have legal force. And, and so these, lack, these, these poorly aligned or non-aligned <coughs> planning systems and governance systems are producing, with their different institutional forms, these overlapping geographies of rights and claims and really implying different visions for how national space should be occupied. 
and by who, and how national spaces should be governed, and by who. And what I want to suggest, and moving on to my next session, is that that's helpful for thinking about the, the nature of conflictiveness that has surrounded natural resource extraction uh, in, in the region. More in some countries, less in other countries, although the, the conflictiveness is, is, is a has seemed to be a relatively re recurrent factor in many areas. <coughs> Parts of Chile would be one of the notable exceptions, I think. Because in the language of some of that earlier, some of that earlier, more conceptual discussion, 15, great, thank you. Um, what, what's also going on in those maps is the sort of layering that Mahoney and Salem talked about of institutions, put layers on top of other layers, and in certain instances, efforts to displace, <coughs> efforts to displace one set of institutions related to, let's say, protected area management, with another set of institutions related to natural resource extraction in the same areas. And that those patterns of displacement and layering of rules throw light on axes of conflict. And I want to just talk about five. I'm not sure. This is the way, it's, over time, I and colleagues, we found it helpful to talk about different axes of conflict in these processes. The first relates to uncertainty. One of the arguments about the maps of concessions that I hear often, and I think there's a lot of legitimacy to the argument, is that the concession maps overstate the significance of what's going on. Because they're not maps of mines, or maps of wells, or maps of pipelines. They're just maps of rights to explore. Rights that are possessed, but they may not be drawn down in all cases. So one of the arguments is that these, these maps overstate the extent of the influence of the sector. So did they say anything at all? And one of the things that I have come, that I want to argue here is they still say something. And they, they actually convey a sense of the geographies of uncertainty produced <coughs> by these processes. Because when you find out, not because you've been consulted, because concessions for exploration are never consulted, but when you find out, or virtually never consulted, never say never, as I'll say to my daughters, um, when you find out there's a concession under your property, under your com community, under your valley, under, the, under your apple, then your sense of the future potentially changes forever. Your sense of what may happen to your water resources changes forever. And then on top of it, that uncertainty gets made even more acute because some of these international ideas that circulate about contamination, about acid mine drainage, about water resources, only accentuate the uncertainties that we feel Otherwise, anyway. So one thing these overlaying sets of claims and rights um, on resources do, I want to argue, is produce uncertainty. And we know from the literature on social movements and social mobilization that it's not that uncertainty always causes mobilization, but there is a link between um, rapid increases in uncertainty and potential for protest. Other parts of these geographies produce loss, loss of something. So these are just a few images. <coughs> and again, in this case, which is actually from Yanukovych, um, again, this can seem like a kind of vague, fluffy idea. Um, but it's certainly come up a lot in our interviews. I don't know about other of you in the room. It's a sense of loss of landscape. Losing landscapes that meant something to you and your forebears, i.e. symbolically, spiritually, or at the very least in terms of memories, they get lost. That's less the case when it's, when it's mining by Sokolon, but when it's open cast mining, as many of these projects are. Landscapes that get lost. Resources that get lost. At the top, it's a community that had, had, had its pipes, but it lost its water, and so the water was now being delivered by um, uh, tankers. <coughs> And then this is an effort to map, and absolutely the map overstates because of the scaling of the map, but it was an effort to try and map um, something that I just don't know how to translate into English. There must be a term, passivos ambientales, due to um, sort of environmental liabilities, due to the histories of mining, that are also losses. So another axis 
one around uncertainty, one around loss, helping to explain sort of narratives of complaint and contention. <coughs> Something else that um, I think, again, can seem fluffy, but it strikes me as important also is that those maps imply different ideas about how space should be governed and by whom space should be governed. And there are many potential indicators of that, but in, in one piece of field research, which is in the Chaco, in Tarija, uh, in the east of Bolivia, uh, southeast of Bolivia, really struck me with these, these signs. These signs are inside a TCO, a kind of proto-territorial claim for uh, a Wayani group, the TCO Tikawasu. But Itikawasu was also on top of a, a very large gas deposit. Very large gas deposit. So they're not both Itikawasu. The Repsol is Itikawasu. This is just down the road, the Petrobras one. But you're inside the TCO, and the signage carries the symbols of the hydrocarbon company. Just as a sort of everyday marker in the landscape about shifts in who's governing this space. Shifts in the governance of space. Shifts in who's claiming authority to put street signs in the ground and tell you where things are. <coughs> but of course, not everything is loss at all. These are also geographies of opportunity, of potentially vast opportunities. Some around employment, much more limited. Um, many more around community development funds and new infrastructure. And yet more, in some countries more than others, depending upon the tax codes, around tax transfers back to the areas in which the extraction has occurred. But by the same token, those opportunities, by definition, and again, this is where, it's a very simple idea, but by definition, spatially, the distribution of those opportunities is going to be uneven, depending on how close you are or not to the mine site, depending upon where you fall on either line of administrative uh, divisions to, uh, and some get receiving more tax transfers, others receiving less. So that produces phenomenal opportunities, <coughs> but that are also unevenly distributed locally and also nationally. Particularly when those tax transfers favour areas where extraction occurs, areas where extraction is not occurring are certainly not benefiting in the same way. <coughs> I think that also helps explain some of the dynamics uh, in, in Bolivia over the last few years. I've worked closely with a colleague, a Spanish colleague, um, Javier Ariano, uh, and his work suggests that at least for the mid-2000s, 2004 through to 2008, there was work that was more quantitative, more econometric than anything else. The conflicts were, more conflicts could be explained by struggles over tax transfers than struggles over human rights, water, loss, or anything. I know the struggles that take various forms. They may be contention around local mm -hmm. elections, they may be efforts to recall the mayor, which are also efforts on the part of other political groupings to gain access to the same resources that the mayor, the mayor was governing. Um, but the, the pattern was the opportunity in the form of tax transfers was generating significant conflict. I'm going to skip this one for reasons of time. Nine minutes. Nine minutes. Um, yeah, I'll skip this one. This is all, I think, this, anyway, I'll skip it. So, just in terms of trying to tie some of these loose ends together. I'm not sure I'm tying them together, but to, to, to throw out some closing thoughts. <coughs> if these processes are producing these kind of overlays of institutions and of claims, of anticipations and of fears, um, it's not unsurprising that they, that they come accompanied or they help create new, not necessarily brand new, but new axes of conflict, and have been associated with the emergence of actors contending issues around those, those conflicts. Actors of various sorts. Actors that may be rights-based in their contentions, human rights claims, water rights claims, whatever it may be, but also actors who come together to claim access to rents, access to opportunities. Um, there's not time now to go into any detail, but, but another pattern that's also clear is that 
in most of these mobilizations, it's, it's very rarely the case that these organized actors are brand new. They're, they're issues being adopted by prior pre-existing organizations and movements. Um, and in the process of adopting them, that may change elements of the organization and the movement, but they're being adopted by those movements and became part of a, of, of a more general uh, agenda. So thinking back to some of those ideas at the beginning, <coughs> excuse me, from Asim Mogul and Robinson, and, uh, and the ideas about political settlements, there's some sense in which these processes help create actors, help create new spaces and opportunities for actors to contend not just these processes, but some of the political settlements that underlie the national project of the producing these processes. And that can get manifested in some of the, the sort of national political debates that you, you see in Bolivia, can get manifested, or Peru, can get manifested in um, arguably being part of, not the only part at all, but part of the explanation for the space that emerged for the FMLN to be elected in El Salvador in 2008. So inducing mobilization that, unsta that actually unsettles some of the same settlements that have produced these national political projects that encourage expanded investment in the sector. So sort of to use um, another author that I'm not referring to here historically, what Karl Polanyi, the kind of student of, of the transition to uh, capitalism in the UK, if you will, particularly in the UK, would call a, a sort of double movement. It's a, it's, a, it's a process that induces its own response that then tries to re-regulate that process. And an important part of this story is not just the, the, the thinking back to that box in the little diagram. Not, there was part of it that referred to social conflict, another part referred to institutional innovation and learning. I think another part of, important part of the story is the extent to which some of these the, these processes have also been accompanied by what I call here, I'm not sure it's the best term, counter movements within the state itself, <coughs> within parts of government itself. They begin to worry about some of these overlapping geographies of benefit and producers, begin to worry about the implications for natural resources, for water resources, begin to worry about the implications for indigenous rights. And there are certain spaces, because these counter movements are not across the whole of government, but certain spaces that come up relatively often across countries where one sees this. Some of those spaces are linked to human rights ombudsman's offices, or procurator's offices, part, which are really part of the state and less part of the government. <coughs> Ministries of environment, <coughs> in some countries more than others. Um, the Constitutional Court, in the case of Colombia, has been an important space for pushing back against some of these, um, some of the implications and consequences of these overlapping rights. For example, pushing back on the granting of concessions in paramount and highland grasslands if they're involved in water resources, and some subnational governments. And the recurrently, what the role that these actors play is one of is one that social movements never play. They're very, very hard for social movements to play. It's, it's, it's far more harder for movements to resist and contest but to convert contestation into more specific arguments about what that would really mean for normative change, for regulatory change, for legal change. It's just not what movements do. They're not, not, generally not good at that. And that's, I think, what you see happening in some of these domains. So one of the important sources, not the only, but it's certainly a very important source for some of the thinking about the legislation around free crime, around consulta Premier in Peru, was indeed the Human Rights Ombudsman's Office in Peru trying to make sense of conflicts around, uh, around mining and hydrocarbons. Um, so these are bodies that kind of are able to, what the, or the role they play, consciously or unconsciously, is, to, is translating demands into proposals for, for regulatory change, whether it's around prior consultation, around land use planning, around um, water resource management. Um, and again, there's not much time to talk about this, but also what's, I think, important in many of these instances is that um, the Constitutional Court would be an exception here, but that 
the people involved in those processes are all that's referred to there as in-migrants into the state. They're, off, they're oftentimes from people who've worked elsewhere beforehand. And political openings have created conditions such as those people move into the state and move into government. But they've worked in NGOs, they've worked in the academy. Um, but these are spaces of trying to think through the, the, the specificities of the institutional implications of these, of these conflicts. Thank you. Um, I won't say much about the next slide. I'm hoping a couple of colleagues later today and tomorrow will have more to say. But I think it's also, it's also important to recognize that, in, and this varies uh, such a lot across companies, so it's really important, again, for when we're talking about this, just by the same token that it's, you can't say, the government does this, because you have ministries of the environment that are thinking differently, human rights ombudsman's officers are thinking differently, as you say. Same for companies. Some companies where you see much more discussion within, within in-house about that's driven by concerns about what this means for the security of an investment environment in which, they're, in which they're operating. Efforts to innovate from within, inside companies, as well as from their shareholders. And then a whole group of um, knowledge networks that have emerged around this. And this is to do with the, the curve I imagined at the end, uh, at the end of the comment on the, the first slide. So we form to map publications <coughs> or graph publications about hydrocarbons, about extractive industries, about mining, they'd also show that jump. Well, that's also reflective of the emergence of new sorts of knowledge networks around these themes, trying to produce ways of thinking about what the devil's going on. Not necessarily making explicit arguments about how things should change, but suggesting directions of change. Um, some more radical some much more um, committed to the notion that natural resources have a place to an important role to play in development strategies, but trying to rethink, nonetheless, how that role would be organized and, and regulated. Um, again, uh, my apologies, not much, there's not time to go into, into, into the specificities. Um, but what I want to suggest is that in that set of intersections between protests, between counter movements within government and parts of the state, within parts of companies, um, and in these knowledge networks, is a process of <coughs> attempting to innovate institutionally. To think through what would free crime informed consent look like here? Or at least what would crowd consultation look like here? And what, under what conditions might it be institutionalized? What would land use planning look like here? And under what conditions would it be institutionalized? Um, so it's that middle bit in the diagram. Now I said at the beginning um, <coughs> that the, and I don't want to make great claims for the, the extent to which this, those social phenomena, which I think are real, and I suspect a number of you in the room work with people like that. You're collaborating with human rights ombudsman's offices. You're collaborating with certain people inside certain companies. You're collaborating with certain people inside certain ministries of the environment. But that's all fine and dandy, and given that they exist, there is, therefore, institutional change. The lesson from that literature on political settlements and political equilibrium would be that it's an, it's a, it's a, it's an uphill process. If the concatenation of institutions that can exist at any one point in time depends upon power relationships, then there will be significant resistance to these suggested processes of change, which is perhaps why, or part of an explanation of why, as you, or I would suggest, if you look across the landscape of extractive industries in the region, you see lots of sort of stalled or half-completed innovations. So perhaps the most recent stalled innovation is one that Carlos can talk about a lot, um, and, and John also, the yes or me things. Um, stalled uh, innovations around free prior informed consent or consult of Bravia in Peru, where in a sense what's happened over the past month or six weeks is that that group of in-migrants into, in that case, the Ministry of Culture, trying to carry forward that process, have been have left, been pushed out, well, pushed and jumped, did they jump or were they pushed? It's a combination, it's a bit of both. Um, 
But so you have a stalled debate around how prior consultations are going to be organized and regulated in Peru, around land use planning, um, and around new mining codes, <coughs> just as some examples. And also particular projects. And again, I think Diana today or tomorrow will talk about some projects that have, like Tia Maria or Congo in Peru that are absolutely stalled. And part of that stalling is this kind of, it's like a, it's like a, um, what's the opposite, opposite of checkmate in chess, but no one wins? Okay, thank you. I, I can only claim tiredness from the flight. Um, but sort of stalemates. <coughs> it's indicative of that contention around trying to rethink design at the project level or at a national level. <coughs> the final case I wanted to talk do I have a minute or not? From out of what? Yes, one minute. Yeah. One minute. <laughs> um, it's to do with El Salvador. It's a case because I was involved in this one personally. And um, under that FMLN, this FMLN, uh, or the only ever FMLN government in the South of the Carmel, um, the decision was, and this was an institutional innovation, to say, okay, we're not going to jump headlong into redefining the mining code straight away, the mining law, the mining policy. What we're going to do is conduct a strategic environmental assessment of the whole sector, <coughs> and on the basis of that, think through policy and hope that that SEA process also serves as a vehicle for giving technical legitimacy to the proposed new uh, mining law that would come out of that process. And that's what, that's what happened. Um, a, new, a proposal for a draft mining law that would act, the proposal says it would um, suspend all administrative actions linked to mining indefinitely until a whole series of conditions were met, conditions to do with regulatory capacity inside the government, above all. So it's conditions to do with, with taxation, but primarily conditions to do with regulatory capacity inside government. And only once those conditions were met would administrative procedures reinitiate. So, and, and they have to be reinitiated for anything to move forward in the mining sector. And yet that proposal is kind of sitting now languishing inside the assembly in El Salvador. And one of the, not dead, but, but, but not vibrant, and one of the explanations that seem to explain why that happened <coughs> is that the kind of coalition or collaboration between the Ministry of Environment and the church and certain activist groups at the, at the beginning of the process, broke down, even though people from the Ministry of Environment came from the same world. And it broke down because of a kind of politics of, of absolutes, in that the civil society groups insisted that they would only be content with a law that banned mining outright. And this law was not strong enough for them. And as a consequence, that innovation um, is incomplete. And that seems to me to be a very sort of specific, particular case of a coalition that emerged and then was not able to hold itself together for long enough to allow the innovation to become institutionalized. So that's my way of closing on those. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs>
the ministry is operating according to the ministry's objectives. Even in the in, in the Arena period, this is also a period of a government of post peace accords, where there's an effort to try and rebuild peace in the post war period. So even in the Arena government, there will be parts of government that will be more worried about what needs to be done to guarantee and stabilize peace. And those parts of government were not talking together in that process. So the FMLA government then comes in and elaborates a couple of years into its period, a national development plan that uh, emphasizes um, peace, democratization, rights, security. Those overlapping geographies become even more of a, of a problem because they challenge the viability of the, some of the strategic objectives of that larger, of that larger plan. Um, there are instances, I think less in, less in the case of El Salvador, there are instances when, the, it, when there is a clear notion of trying to encourage extractive industry in certain areas for broader development processes. So I think more often the process is other events, and it's the, the geography of the initial exploratory activity is determined by other factors. And then ex post facto, the work has to be done to then link that to an agenda for development. So, um, so development, if you think of it in very, very crude terms, very simple terms, very often development is thought through in función de mining, rather than mining being thought through in función de development. One of the things that came to mind to me when you asked me a question related to um, where the public sphere is in Latin America. Because one argument to, one, argument, one interpretation of why more emphasis on corruption rather than substance might also be that the press goes for the one over the other. And that, in turn, helps induce certain sorts of behavior, but also constrains debate. So I think there's a very, there really is an important question about where the public sphere is in the region. My intuition is that there, oftentimes there are, there are actually more kind of decentralized, localized public spheres, and there are a few where substantive debate occurs. And there are a few um, national institutions that help bridge those debates to foster substantive national debate. And with exceptions, the press, which is the primary institution, the universities would be the, the other, I suppose, um, does not necessarily do that well. Which again may have implications for how one thinks about democracy in the region. So if the quality of a democracy is defined not only by, and I'm not saying that we're any better in the States at all, apart from the New York Times perhaps, but uh, and National Public Radio, but if part of a democracy is defined not just by electoral processes, but by the creation of a public sphere for serious debate about substance, this is me betraying my old, for the social theorists among you, my old Habermasian um, preferences, um, then the democracy is impoverished in that sense, because if there's not a vehicle for having those public debates, that in turn has implications for the criteria that people draw upon when they make their votes in electoral, in moments of elections. Um, the subtext of that is the, this, the comment on politicization, which I think is really interesting because very often in some of these, some of these conflicts, I, I hear it said that um, it's, a, it's used as a criticism that the problem here is that they're not, they're not talking about mining, they're, they're making it a political issue. Absolutely. My sense is, well, but it is a political issue, which is not the same as saying it's a party-based party issue. <coughs> now, it's also true that sometimes it gets translated into a party-based issue rather than a political issue. Um, but that politicization and the cultivation of it and then the creation of national institutions through which it can be transformed, it can feed into the substantive debates nationally, it seems to me to be really important for the quality of democracy. Um, 
and becomes a very important vehicle for regulation of the industry. So social license becomes something that happens not just at a project level, but at a national level as well. I think social license is not just a project-based issue. I've heard, I've been in meetings with, um, as you asked me a question, John, about, and then what immediately came to mind was a meeting with one of the guys from one of the owners of the main Peruvian national <coughs> mining company was saying, we have to get this stuff out as quickly as possible while prices are high. And um, so exactly what you're saying. And that being a, uh, a reflection that, ref that, that it reflects responding to incentives that are market-based, company-based, and not affected by transnational discussions about climate change and so on. And of course, there's all sorts of issues in those discussions about climate change to do with distribution that the yes and e argument also stumbled over, among other things. Um, but I th that's where, among the, again, back, that's back to the issues of the press and of the national public sphere and certain ministries of environment has potentially played a really important role in creating spaces in which those discussions about global climate change and the national implications would become much more enrolled in discussions about mining and agriculture at a national level as well. But of course it's easy to say that as a, as, um, as a wealthier country rather than a poorer country. And the thing on the UN, the only thing that comes to mind is um, I've been involved in one, I may or may not be going to another depending on my teaching schedule, um, a day to like, um, off the record discussions with UNDP teams in, in the region <coughs> about extraction. And the one that was a, primarily with the Central American teams was happened because the UNDP teams had lots of ideas that essentially didn't know what to do. Now, not dying what to do either, but in the sense that they were confronting a situation in Central America where there was saying, what? We have these, another overlaps again. And another overlap I didn't mention today, so extraction, indigenous territories, and the narco economy. And the sort of paralysis of not knowing how to respond to that level of um, uncertainty and to not, therefore not, and not knowing how to handle the question of extractive industries because it was intersecting with, particularly with the narco economy. Um, so that's not a very, it's not a very encouraging answer, but at least to say that within the UNDP teams, they're thinking about it. The next stage is knowing quite what to do, and the problem with these sorts of contexts, particularly the context of Central America, is if you didn't do anything at all, you really have to have the courage of your convictions because the likelihood of things not going according to plan is, is, is very, 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 very high. Um, and that's what sort the of approach of your convictions is, a quality that's not necessarily the UN, UN's strongest card. Thank you, Anthony. Well, I think we started. <laughs>